when I saw this one big black limousine coming in one day, I was on the road and I looked at it and the word whisper just went around, Kempe Tai, Kempe Tai. And I stood there watching them. And then I hoped that the doors would open, Miss Kemp and Miss Seeley would be released. But when they didn't, get out of the car and nothing but officers and soldiers. And they went up into the headquarters. I knew in my heart they'd come for me. So I started to move very slowly over toward the headquarters. And suddenly out came Sweet 17. And he just motioned for me to come quickly. He said, they're calling for you. So I ran up into the headquarters, and here were these men. Now, as languages have come easily to me, but I tried my best not to learn anything that I didn't have to learn in Japanese. I had to learn enough for the bed checks at night, for us to stand at attention and to bow, and then to greet him. And I couldn't understand a word they were saying. They were walking around me and laughing to one another. And finally, one of them put a piece of paper down on the desk in front of me. And I looked at it, and I read my name, Darlene Dibler. And he, uh, he said, are you Darlene Dibler? I said, yes, sir, I'm Darlene Dibler. But I didn't write that. He said, and I didn't ask you if you wrote it. He said, how much do you know about Morse code? Well, then he began to tap out things on the desk. I said, sir, I do not know anything about Morse code. I have never studied it. If that's what you're tapping out there, I, I don't know what you're saying, because I do not know Morse code. Oh, he laughed. He said, go back and get another dress. He said, we'll take you. We'll find out how much you know about Morse code. So I ran back to the barracks, and the first thing I grabbed was my Bible, and then another dress. And um, that day, I had on a dress. I don't know why. Uh, God knew that in the afternoon I was to be taken away. He knew why he had put it in my heart to take, put on a dress. So I came back and I had another dress in my hand and my Bible, and they opened the door, and they, two officers on either side of me and the soldiers, and we were taken out of the camp, and then I was taken down to the city of Makassar, which I knew very well, having been there for those years. And I saw they were pulling up into a circular driveway in front of what had formerly been the native insane asylum. And when we pulled around so that I could see this first cell block, and I saw in the last cell over there was Miss Kemp. Now, Miss Kemp had been quite a large woman. And she was hanging on the bars there, and I could see her arms all black and blue. And she kept shaking her head at me like this. And I knew that she had been uh, without sufficient food because she had lost so much weight. And when I, I stepped out of the car, I just said, God, you took Russell. Do I have to go through this as well? And so sweetly, my Lord said, my child, I want you to remember, it is those that I love that I chasten. And I said, all right, Lord. But I said, whatever you do, help me to be a good soldier for you. And I remember the very last words Dr. Jaffrey ever said to me when he was being taken away from our camp. He leaned over the tailgate, and he was a Scotsman. And he looked down at me, and he said, Lassie, whatever you do, be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. And those words came to me. I could hear him saying it as though it had been at that moment. And I said, yes, Lord. I said, don't ever let me cry in front of them, no matter what they do to me. And I said, I don't want any of my fellow Americans, if I ever come out of this, for them to hear what's going to happen to me in this prison. I don't want anybody ever to be ashamed of me. First thing he grabbed was this Bible. He said, you're not having that book in there. He said, you'll just sit in there and you'll read that and not think about your evil deeds against the Imperial Japanese Army. He didn't know that as a little girl, I went to bed every night with this book in front of me. And I began to memorize it. And I started in Genesis. And there was much of this book that was there on the grooves of my mind for the Holy Spirit just to drop the needle down on it and play it back to me. And I, uh, 
so I didn't mind him taking my Bible. But then we went through the next cell block. And then I heard Miss Seely, this godly gray-haired woman, and I knew that just within those two weeks, that woman was a raving maniac. It was just terrible, the things she was saying, and the terrible, the way she was uh, screaming, and, and I, maybe she was trying to sing. I don't know, because she, she was tone deaf. And yet here was a woman that had been up in China, was one of our finest speakers of Chinese, Dr. Jaffrey said. And when she told me one day that she was tone deaf, I, I laughed. I said, Philoma, that can't be true. I said, Chinese is a tonal language. I said, then how did you ever learn Chinese? And she said, up there in Wu Chao, on my knees in the attic. And I thought, that's right. If God calls you to a place, he equips you to do the work he called you to. She had to know the Chinese language, and God gave it to her, even though she was tone deaf. Maybe she was trying to sing, but it was awful, the raucous voice that came out of that cell. And that was the next cell block. And then we walked on, and we went across an exercise ground. And I saw this big cell block there, and I noticed that one of them had been boarded up. The window was completely concealed. And um, the guard yelled at me to go. And I tell you, the point of a bayonet in your back is a very grand persuader. I went, and I went over there, and he motioned for me to turn down into this cell block. And when I got down to that, he stopped in front of the very one that had the window completely boarded up. He stopped there at the door, he took out his key, unlocked the door, threw the door back like this, and then stepped back, and he just shoved me into it. Well, I hit the other side of the, the cell with both hands and turned quickly and came back because he was closing the door. And I got down on my knees, and I was watching the end of the key because I knew that this was death row because I'd looked up and read on the top of the door, Orang Ini Mustimati, this person must die. And I sat there with cold perspiration just running down me, and I just began to sing, and I suddenly realized what I was singing. Sitting there on the floor it was a song I learned as a little girl in Sunday school, and God knows how to choose the verses. I was singing the second verse, which says, Fear not, little flock. Whatever your lot, he enters all rooms, the doors being shut. He never forsakes. He never is gone. So count on his presence from darkness till dawn. And I did. I counted on his presence from darkness till dawn, from dawn till darkness. They left me there for three days without allowing me to relieve myself. I'd had dysentery. God stopped it like that. When I came into this cell, because I knew and I had heard that if you did anything at all on your floor, you had to eat it back up. And I sat on my heel, and I suffered. But I went through those days, and only God could have helped me to have made it through those three days when finally they came and they took me out to what were the native ablution blocks. When he stopped in front of this one door and he just motioned for me to go into that and I reached over and I took the handle and I pulled it open and it just gushed down all over my legs. It was fecal matter from where the prisoners had been using this ablution block. And I just stepped back and I said, God, I said, I have these ulcers on my legs. And just then a young Indonesian who was there rushed up and uh, he said to the guard, he said, would you like me to carry water and clean that out for you? Not for me, but for you. He just went like that. And that boy ran and he brought back bucket after bucket after bucket of water and finally you could see the little hole in the floor. And I went in and closed the door. There was no lock on it. And I said, God, please put it on their hearts to give me 
a tin or something in my cell so that I do not have to come back here again. And when I got back to the cell, late in the afternoon, they brought in a, a half of a kerosene tin, very crudely cut off. Um, one thing that the Japanese never, ever, evidently know, knew anything about was toilet paper. But you know, God understands all of our needs. And then they realized that I had dysentery. So they took me off of the plain rice. Now I can handle plain rice with my fingers. I like to eat rice with my fingers. But they put me on porridge. And that first day when they brought it in, the guard would just spin it across the floor to me. He didn't care if it would upset or what happened to it if my rice went on the floor. And I looked at the, the rice, and because the window was boarded up, there was very little light in the room, but just the transom above the door. And through the light that was coming in, when I picked that up, I could see the rice. And I had clapped my hands when I saw it first, because there was white stuff on there. It was, I was sure it was just fresh grated coconut. And I said, joy, oh, joy, somebody out there knows I just love fresh grated coconut. But when the light hit it, it wasn't coconut. It was full of maggots. And I thought, how am I going to manage this? Because there were just dozens and dozens of these big blue bottle flies because of an open tin with dysentery. And there they were, and they were on to my porridge. And I was trying to get them off and shake them off. And, and I would put it under my dress. And the minute I pulled it out, well, here they were again, and they were right on it. And when I would get some of the maggots up onto the side of the plate there as a tin plate, then the flies would be on it. And I said, well, if they can eat it, so can I. So I never took another maggot out. And I didn't have a spoon, so I had to make a funnel with my hands. And I'd let it run into my mouth. And I had no way of washing my hands or the plate. And I would lick the plate clean, because I needed everything that was on that plate. It was about 2 thirds of a cup of rice and uh, was full of maggots. And that was all I was ever given. I was never given drinking water. And I realized how good it was that I was getting porridge because I was getting some fluid just with that porridge. And I would lick my fingers then, one after the other. And then I'd spit on the palms of my hands to try to get them clean. That's the only way I stayed clean. Because in all the months I was there, I was never given water to wash my hands with. And I would uh, spit on my hand and get my face clean. I. Um, was never given a bath, only once. And that happened to be that there were two women um, from my barracks that were brought down. They were trying to find some money. And uh, those girls were really beaten badly. And um, But they didn't want them to know my condition. So they allowed me to go out and have a bath that one day. And that was near the beginning of my time in, in the secret police prison. But apart from that, I never had anything to wash with. And uh, it was nothing but two boards that they put on the floor. And the first morning after I slept on them, I was glad for them at first, because it was ceramic tile on the floor. And it gets cold even in the tropics at night. And I had no blanket was ever given to me. And I was so grateful for this dress, because it had a complete circular skirt. And so I would wind it around myself when I went to bed at night to keep some warmth. And when I got up the next morning after them bringing in those two planks, I thought, oh, my. Not only do I have uh, the mosquitoes on top of me at night, but I have them coming in underneath those boards. But when I lifted up the board and began to examine them, it was crawling with bed bugs. And so I took out a, one of my hairpins, and I would flick them out onto the floor and kill them as they ran across the floor. And then I had to, to spit on the floor and wipe it up with my dress in order to get that blood off of there. I'd learned my lesson well. He came in one day. I had gone around the walls and killed all these uh, mosquitoes that were full of my blood. 
And when he saw that blood on that wall, he was so angry with me. He said, I am just going over to this place. When I'm back, I want to see every drop of blood off of that wall. So I, I went around quickly, and I was frightened, and I took my fingernail, and I would scratch that off the wall, and then I got down to the quick. And so I took this one, and I used my fingers until they were down to the quick, and they began to bleed. Then I had to start with the next one. But I got it all off, but all my fingernails were gone down to the quick, and they were bleeding. So I would have to spit on the floor and get that blood off of the floor from all these bed bugs. And I'd then blow the little bodies out toward the door and, and blow it out underneath and hope that the wind would come and get them away from the door before the guard came again. And then I was called for the hearings. I don't know what you've heard about hearings, but I know what brainwashing is. And I understand what it is to be brutalized. My eyes were blacked because them striking me between my eyes. And uh, I didn't realize there were so many nerves there. And uh, they used judo chops on me. I thought many times they were going to break my neck. And this I know, that with God, you can stand tremendous pain. And I had asked the Lord never to let me cry before them. So when I went into that hearing room, I stood tall. And I sat down there, and I never cried no matter what they did. But when I got back to the cell, I'll be honest with you, I wept buckets of tears. I just throw myself out on the floor and I say, God, I can't go through another one of those. I really can't. And I would cry and cry. And when I had no more tears to cry, my Lord would say, my child. And I'd sit up and I'd say, yes, Lord. He would say, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Not that it has been and not that it's going to be. But right now it is. And I would dry my tears. And then I realized why the Lord had laid it on my heart to memorize a poem by Annie Johnson Flint, that woman that suffered so badly from rheumatoid arthritis all her life. But from her pen came this beautiful poem. And two of our missionaries had set it to music, Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Morgan. And they had sung it at our last conference. And I would sit up in the cell and begin to sing, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, He addeth His mercy. And to multiplied trials, His multiplied peace. When we have exhausted that store of endurance and our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of that hoarded resources, then Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. And I knew I could go through another one and another one. As the Lord poured in his own grace, One day I realized I had malaria, and that was cerebral malaria, the kind that very often affects the brain and very often uh, results in death. And I knew I had had this malaria, and I was perspiring, and I would wet my clothes just completely through with the perspiration. And then I'd stand up, and I'd walk across the floor with my dress to try to get it dry again. And that day, I felt I just had to get up and get some air on my face. So I climbed up the window and put my foot on the doorknob, and I grabbed the bars of the transom above the door, and there I hung. Now, there was an overhang of the roof, so nobody could see me, but I could see out. And suddenly, I saw the guard coming, and he had a group of native prisoners. They were there for minor misdemeanors. They were allowed to exercise in the afternoon. 
but it was very exciting for me to even see another human face other than the man who had been trying me in the guard. And I was looking down at them, and all of a sudden I was attracted by one woman because she was doing something the rest weren't. They were just walking carefully back and forth. But this woman, every time she saw the guard go that way, she just scurried off in this direction. And I was watching her, and I thought, now, why does she do that? And he, he turns around, he stomps his feet, and they wore the hijack boots like the Gestapo did. And when she heard him stomp his feet and make his turn, she just stopped dead and totally relaxed. And nobody knew that she was going in one direction, but I sure did. And I don't know why she was doing it. So I just kept looking at her, and then I saw that way down there was a fence, and on that fence was Honolulu Creeper. And here went the guard, and there went that woman. And she got to the fence, and she put out her hand, and a hand came through the Honolulu Creeper and put a big bunch of bananas on her hand. Oh, I could smell them. I could remember the flavor of bananas. And I just got right off of the door, and I jumped down onto the floor. And I said, God, I'm not asking you for a whole bunch of bananas like she has. Could I just have one banana? And then I tried to think of how God could do it. And I was going to tell him how I was going to help him. And I know that you've probably done the same thing. So I said, <clears throat> I have four possibilities. I said, these two, those are the men that have been trying me. I know that neither one of them would bring me a banana. And this is that guard, because they were the only four people I saw. I said, that guard wouldn't either. And I said, this is that old Indonesian. I believe that man knows who I am. I said, I think that if you told him, he would even try to get a banana to me. But I said, Lord, oh, no, no, Lord. Don't even put it in his mind to bring me a banana, because if he brought it and were caught, they'd just shoot him like that. And I said, Lord, there just is no way you could get a banana in here to me. And I said, I am so grateful for even this bit of porridge. And maybe I'm even getting protein from these maggots that are in it. And I said, please forgive me for asking for a banana when there's really no way you could get one in here to me. The next day, I heard officers coming. And often, when ships came into the harbor, they would bring them to the prison. And you'd be put out in front of them. They'd laugh at you. You had to bow to every one of them. And if you didn't bow down to a 90-degree angle, they'd beat you across the back with the canes that they were ca always carried. And I said, Lord, there are officers coming. I can hear them because I recognize the way they scuff their heels with these leather boots. And I said, I'm very weak. And I said, you know that. But I said, just pour your own resurrection life into my body now so that I can stand up tall and I can make a good bow for these men when they come to the door. The door was unlocked. And when the door was open, who's standing in the door? It was Mr. Yamaji. And I looked at him, and he was smiling. And it had been so long since I'd even seen a smile on anybody's face. And I just clapped my hands. I said, oh, Tony Yamaji, so pretty liat so about young lama. I said, Mr. Yamaji, it's like seeing an old friend. And the tears came in his eyes. He didn't say a word to me. He just walked back out. And he was talking to these men. And they were the men that had been trying me. And they had come to bring him down to my cell. I didn't know at the time. But I thought to myself, because I saw them go like this, and. They didn't look at me again and sneer at me like they usually did. And I thought, Mr. Yamaji is telling them what I told him that day when I heard that Russell was dead and I was in the office with him. And later he confirmed it. He said, I told him what you had said to me. And I said that no woman that believes like that could ever be a spy. Finally, he just turned and came back in and he looked at me, and I didn't know that three days after I, after I had been told that I was to be executed as an American spy, 
and he drew his finger across his throat, the officer of the Kempe Tai, that they had gone then up to the camp and told Mr. Omaji, do not expect her to come back because we have uh, found out that she has tuberculosis and she's dying, so she'll never return to camp and tell the women that. And that was the message that they had gotten three days before. And so Mr. Yamaji came down, and he spent the next three days going from one office to the other until he finally got permission from someone for me to come in, for him to come in to see me. And that's how he got in there. And when he came back in, he looked at me and he said, yes, you are very ill, aren't you? Well, I was really just skin and bone then. I was dehydrated, but um, I, uh, there was just, my hands were like bird claws. And I developed a beriberi, which is a form of dropsy. And I had enormous legs because they'd filled up with the fluid. And, uh, but the upper part of my body was just skin and bone. And he looked at me and he said, oh my, you are, you're very ill. He said, I'm going back to the camp. And he said, the women are all asking how you are. He said, uh, do you have something I can tell them? And I said, yes, Mr. Yamaji, when you go back, I said, would you tell them for me that I'm all right? And they'll understand, and Mr. Yamaji, I think you'll understand. I'm still trusting in the Lord. And that man nodded to me, he understood. And he turned, never another word, and walked out of the cell. And when he was gone and the door was pulled shut and locked, it just hit me. I didn't bow to those two officers. And I thought, as soon as Yamaji's gone, then I'll be taken back to the hearing room. And I said, God, I'm going to remain standing here. And you just help me to walk tall for you and to be a good soldier, not cry. And when the door went open, I heard the guard coming. He opened that door, and he walked in. He just laid them all out on the floor. And you know what they were. They were bananas. He said, they're all yours, and they're all for Mr. Yamachi. I don't know what you would have done. But I sat down, and I looked at those bananas. And in all my walk with my Lord, I've never known such shame as I knew that day. I said, I have no right to eat those. I said, here I was telling you yesterday, you couldn't get one banana in here. And I said, Father, look at them. Look at the bananas you've got for me. Then I began to count them, and I don't know why I counted them, except that maybe you should know there were 92 bananas. I just pushed him off in the corner, and he said, but listen, my child. I said, look, Lord. I said, that's almost a hundredfold. He said, but that's what I delight to do. And then I wanted to eat them all at once. <laughs> and I knew I didn't dare, because if I had gotten sick, then I'd have to eat that back up off the floor. And I've only enjoy enjoyed food going both ways once, and maybe I won't have time to tell you about it. So I said, Lord, I don't have much character, but please help me not to take any more bananas than my body can assimilate at a time. And then when they came to take me away, it was the morning when I had peeled the last black banana. I didn't throw away anything there except the little bit of skin that was left. I would even scrape that little white stuff inside of the peel. But the skin became very hard like leather, and it was very hard to eat. And I had peeled that, and the guard came and opened the door and said, we're going to take you somewhere else. And so I stood up. I didn't have anything to take with me. But when I walked out the door, knowing how I had used my dress for a mop for everything that was dirty on the floor, and that God knew how important it was to me to be clean. And when I walked out of that cell, that dress was as white and clean as the day I put it on. 
But all I could think was, Lord, you are the same God who led the children of Israel through the wilderness, and their shoes did not wear out, and neither did their clothing. And that was a miracle of God. When we got to the road to go back to our camp, we didn't turn to the left. We turned to the right, went right up to the headquarters where the executions took place. God had been speaking to me for two or three days and just three phrases of a verse in Corinthians that says, who delivered and doth deliver, he will yet deliver. The, only those three phrases. And I would say to him, Lord, I know you have delivered me from the law of sin and death, and I'm free. I'm free. And he would say, who delivered and doth deliver, he will yet deliver. I'd say, God, how could you ever get me out of this prison? And he'd come right back, who delivered and doth deliver, he will yet deliver. So I thought, maybe I am going to be taken back to the camp. But we didn't turn to go to the camp. We turned to go to the place of execution. Miss Kemp and Miss Seeley were with me. They had to sign a paper, write it out. And Miss Seeley, whose mind was gone, was not able to do anything. And Miss Kemp said, I couldn't write it. And I could see she was just black and blue all over her arms and her legs where they were underneath her dress. I could see they had been beaten too. And when we got her back to the hospital, she was black and blue from her shoulders to her wrists, from her waist to her knees. They had beaten her to try to get her to write out a confession that I had been doing spy work so they wouldn't have to try me. And she said, I would say, no, I know she's never been a spy. No, I know she's never had a radio. And this was what they were accusing me of. They said that there was a Chinese who'd seen me in the jungle having contact with the Allies. Nothing you said could have changed their minds. They had to have someone as a victim. And so then they were, I wrote it for her. She said, darling, please write it. I couldn't write it. So I went over and I wrote as he dictated it to me that they were, we are very, very thankful for the Japanese that they have forgiven us for our terrible deeds against the Imperial Japanese Army. And then they had to come over and both of them, their thumbs were taken and put on the black pad and they had to put their thumbprint on that. And then he reached over and grabbed my hand and he put my thumb into the ink and onto that as though I were confessing to having done things against the Imperial Japanese Army. Well, they gave us the last meal. I don't know why they ever bothered to give the last meal, but it was the most beautiful rice I'd seen in years. And there was just plain rice, and then there was a piece of pumpkin. And then I was taken by the head of the team from the Kempe Thai. And I was taken to be executed. And I stood there before that man, and he had a sheaf of papers, and he was reading through how that I had been uh, reporting on how many soldiers they had, where their airports were, uh, how many were moving into the area above the camp, and on and on and on. And none of it was true, but he had written it out as though that was my confession. And um, finally he stopped, and he threw it on the floor, and he grabbed the hilt of his sword, and he started to pull it out. And when I looked and I was watching his hand, and I stood there and I was th just frozen, and I was watching that sword coming out of the hilt, and suddenly my heart began to sing, I'll live for him who died for me. And I said, God, that's a strange song when I'm going to die. And I looked at that sword and it was almost out. And all of a sudden, just at that moment of time, Cars were coming around that headquarters building, horns honking, people screaming and yelling. They must have called his name 
because he just put the sword back into the sheath and he ran. And he went into the headquarters where they were there and talking, and they talked and they talked and talked. And everybody was always, would always say to me, why didn't you run? Why didn't you hide? There was no hiding place. There was no place to run. And so I stood there waiting for him to come back to complete the execution, knowing that I was under the greatest hiding place of all, under the shadow of the Almighty. He came back. He grabbed my arms, he took me out, and he threw me into this little car. And then they brought my phyloma and Miss Kemp back. He put two bottles of wine, or three bottles, I've forgotten now, into my lap and said, these are for Miss Diamaggi. And all of a sudden, we were going down that road like we were top secret material, going back to the camp. And all I could think was, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. Something, some news came in that stopped the execution for some reason. But when we got back to the camp and we were up to the gate and we'd gone over the moat because there was not only barbed wire surrounding us, but there was a moat around that. And you couldn't have gotten off of the property without being seen. And he just reached forward and grabbed me here on my arm. And I was sure he was going to break it because he twisted my arm. And I bit through my lower lip trying to keep from screaming. And he said, if you ever tell anybody anything that happened to you, I'll get you the next time and you'll never come out. And fear came over me. We pulled up in front of the headquarters and they just got out and went inside. So I got out with Margaret Kemp and Miss Seeley and I motioned for people to come and get them and take them to the hospital. And then I saw Miss, Mrs. Presswood coming out of the sewing room. She was coming over toward me. And I walked over and she put her arm around me and guided me back to the barracks. And when I got there, here was a woman who had been untrue to her husband, been living with the Japanese. She was a, a rotten, filthy woman. And she was considered the pariah of the camp. And uh, she came up to me and she said, I've got to speak to you personally. And she pulled me into the dining area. It was just a shed there. And she said, I have here a vasancha, which is just a washcloth that they make it like a, a glove so that you put it on in your hand. And she said, this is for you. And she said, I was in the prison cell with your friend Visha, one of the pastor of our, our the pastor's daughter from the tabernacle there. And she said, she made this for you. And I saw my name embroidered on this. And I said, uh, remembered his words. He said, if you ever tell anybody anything that happened to you, I'll get you the next time and you'll never come out. And I said, I will not take that. And she was so furious with me. She just turned white. She said, you take it. She said, I've been in prison too. And just then Mrs. Presswood came in and I, and I said, Ruth, she's trying to get me to take this. I said, they said if I ever had any contact outside of the camp, they would get me the next time. And I said, I'm going over and I'm going to tell Mr. Yamaji because I know Mr. Yamaji will believe me. And Ruth went up to her and she said, you get out of here. If I ever even see you near her, I don't know what I'll do to you. And I don't think she did know either. But then all my women were coming. And they were surrounding me, and that woman ran, because she knew that they would just really beat her up. She'd gone toward the headquarters, and I thought, that's why those men have not left the camp. They were waiting for her to come back and report that I had taken this from Visha. And so the, she evidently said that she wasn't able to do it. And so they got in the car, and they left. But you know, there was terrible fear on me. I could see Miss Kemp go to the hospital. Here she was, that tremendously big woman. She was just skin and bone too. And then I would go down and I would want to pray with Miss Seely, who was in a little hut. We had to put her in there. And the door was locked and there were bars on the window because we were afraid she'd run away and be killed. And I would stand there and I'd listen to her 
And I'd think, God, how could this happen to that precious woman of faith? And here I am, I'm nothing. And I said, here they're both great women of faith, and who am I to be spared? And I didn't go to sleep. I was so afraid my mind would go while I was sleeping. And it was one night and two nights and three nights and four nights and five nights. I didn't sleep, and during the day I worked trying to just encourage myself in the Word of God, and I would continually be repeating Scripture to him. And then the sixth day I couldn't go anymore. I knew I was finished. And I just walked out on this grassy plot where God had met me so many times. And as I walked back and forth, I said, Lord, I've tried and everything that was within me to reach up to you. And I said, I love you. But I said, I have no more strength. And I threw out my hands and I said, I'm gone. And in that moment, it was like arms went underneath me. And I found I was singing a song written by Dr. A.B. Simpson. Underneath thee, oh, how precious you have not to mount on high, but to rest upon my promise and in trustful resting lie. And I saw it. That's what he wanted me to do, is trust him wholly, because he's wholly trustworthy. And the fear just drained out of me. It was like a physical thing. And I knew that God would restore me body and soul and spirit. We'd had bombings the year before. We began to have bombings again. We had dug our own slit trenches so that we could be uh, sheltered from the shrapnel that would fly into the camp. And one day we were standing outside and we looked up and we saw a small plane coming. And we didn't know whether it was a Japanese plane or whose plane it was. And it came over the camp very low, low enough for us to look up and see an American insignia on the side of that plane. And the pilot was waving his hand. And we were so excited to see him. And then he dropped a big metal thing. We didn't know what it was. And I just, all I could think was, you dummy. Why would you do that? We've got children here in this camp. And children were coming from, from where they had been working on the ground. And I thought, how could you do that? Didn't you see them? And then two days later, I realized that man was trying to make give us a warning. But we didn't know how to read their warnings. We'd never had pamphlets or anything like that. And so that man, when he was gone, we all said, wonder what that means. I wonder what that means. And two days later, we looked toward the east, and there came planes, beautiful planes, double fuselage planes. We had never seen them before. And here they were coming. And in the light of the sun, they were just glistening. And suddenly, we saw silvery planes flying out of the backs of the planes. And I yelled, chocolate bars. And others said, no, it's canned goods. And others said, I think they're pamphlets that they're bringing us. We were all looking for food or for news from the war or from home. We never had Red Cross help, never had any uh, letters from home. We hadn't had anything from our husbands didn't know anything about what was going on beyond that barbed wire fence for those years. And suddenly we heard the whistling of the bombs. We had dug our own slit trenches, as I said. And we ran, I ran, and I jumped into the place where I always lay when we had the bombings. And when my feet hit the bottom of that trench, the Lord said, you borrowed Mrs. Lee's Bible. Mine had gone to pieces. She had an English Bible. She said, why don't you use this for reading to us at night? And so I'd taken it. And I said, you're right, Lord. I have no right to let her Bible burn. So I ran, and I ran into this burning barracks, and I reached up, and there was the Bible right where I had left it that morning uh, at, uh, on the top of the mat on which I slept. And then I came running out, and I saw that they'd finally opened the gate down there at the front where we could get out from these burning buildings that were falling and were being blown by the wind. Uh, the 
burning uh, grass roofs and all of the things that were on fire and we were going in and out between them and finally got to the gate and when we got to the gate and went over the moat here were all of these machine guns set up and Japanese soldiers by the hundreds and they just turned on us when we came across there and uh, they yelled to eat tea door. you just threw yourself out prostrate in front of them and they ran over the top of you they didn't care who you were and they got them all set up and they were machine gunning the planes well the planes turned around and came down and made another sweep over us machine gunning us and the of course the Japanese is the ones they were trying to strike and the machine guns here were beginning to speak again and it was the strangest thing because there were bullets flying up this way and bullets coming down this way and I said God if anybody's alive at the end of this day it will be a miracle and when the last of the planes were gone had gone and we could see nothing more of them and the smoke had died down I lifted my head and I said God it's another miracle again you've spared my life so I found Mrs. Presswood and I said LaRuth let's go back and maybe we can find in the ashes where our our barracks was maybe the cans things we've been eating out of maybe our spoons are there we got back to this barracks and it was nothing but a pile of ashes black ashes and I looked down and right where my bed had been the roof must have blown back and burned my bed burned and it dropped down and nobody knew that all those years I had carried with me a five-year diary full diary and my bride's book and that when it had fallen down had opened up at the center page where the certificate was written in gold ink and I know that wasn't by chance that the wind blew it that way God opened it up and I looked down at that beautiful page the beauty of which I had never even noticed before charred though it was there was gold that had been tried in the fire and it was just glistening in the last light of the sun and I dropped on my knees and I said God I don't have another thing for my married life and as I looked at it, I said, please, God, could I have that? And when I reached over and touched it, it just totally had disintegrated and was gone. And I stood up and I said, God, couldn't I have just had that one thing? And he spoke to me. He said, my child, that's what I want to do with you. I want to make you like pure gold, even if I have to take you through the fire seven times. And I bowed before my Lord. I said, God, I'm available. And then I saw that the woman who was head of the barracks next to mine was standing there just sobbing. And I went over to her and I said, oh, don't cry. She said, but my mattress burned. I said, yes, everything has burned. Everything is gone. But we've so much to thank God for. I said, we're alive. She said, but I... I didn't leave it in the barracks. She said, I took it out and I threw it in the ditch where you always lie. I walked over to that ditch. I have never known such a consciousness of the presence of the Almighty. I looked down into the ditch and right where I had been lying when the Lord reminded me of Mrs. Lee's Bible was the casing from the bomb and the ashes from her mattress. I stood up. And I walked away. And I realized he'd got me out of that ditch to spare my life again. And I said, when I was a little girl, 10 years old, I said to you, Father, that I would go anywhere for you, no matter what it costs. So Lord, I just want to renew my vow today to you. I'll still go anywhere for you as long as you give me life. And I'll not call it the cost anymore. The Japanese must have known that a bombing was planned on our camp. They had to destroy the workforce for the Japanese.
And so they had made some just crude shelters up in the jungle. So they herded us up there. And one of our boys had been struck by a bomb when he was lying in one of those ditches. It had gone through the buttocks and came out, and it just severed the leg. And they had taken him away. And uh, the camp commander called me over and said, I want you to tell Mrs. Paul that they've taken Freddie away. And it was rather late when I came back. And as I told you, I always close the day with prayer with my people. And when I got in there, it just seemed like everybody was asleep. And you wondered how you could ever sleep, because the mosquitoes were there just in swarms. And it was cold and damp. And we were sleeping just on the floor. None of us had any blankets. Nobody had any towels. We had nothing. And I just slipped in very quietly. And I thought, well, I will um, just lie down, and we'll pray in the morning together. And then that night, we had a night raid. And so everybody had to get outside. And I tried to help them to get to the door, and especially those with children, so that they would not lose their way. And we had to just feel to where the trees were in the jungle around us and trying to find a place to, because the alarm went off that there was an air raid coming. And uh, the next, after we got back into the barracks and the all clear had been sounded, and we were there and I heard the women down at the end of the barracks there talking. And uh, finally one of them said, um, my Frau Deibler, are you still awake? And I said, yes, I am. They said, we've been talking about it. You know, every time you've prayed, we have always escaped having a night bombing. Would you, no matter what time it is you come in, wake us up so that we can pray together, because when you pray, God spares us the bombings. And so I told them I would. And from that time on, when I would come back and we would pray, Lord, no night bombings, we never had a night bombing. It was frightening. It was terrifying to the children. And then one day, we were all called over to this open space where the camp had been. And uh, the camp commander and the second in command were all in dress uniform. And they had the burial of the boy who had been killed. I had stayed up that night when the body was brought in because he'd called me. And I stayed there with Freddie until the next day when he could be buried along with the others who had been c killed in the bombing. And they were paying tribute to those that were lost because of the bombing of the Allies. And then it was only a few days after that when we were called over again and we were told that the Hirohito, the emperor, had signed that they would have complete surrender. The war is over, he said. I've seen pictures of the celebrations they had in your big cities. I saw one from San Francisco, another one from New York all the confetti that was coming down, people laughing, people drinking with bottles in their hands and kissing whoever. But it wasn't like that in our camp. It was just a quiet walking with tears in our eyes to one another and saying, thank you for being such a friend to me in these days. And that was our celebration. But everybody was saying, oh, thank God it's over. And I think the angels stopped singing in heaven when they heard from 1,600 voices saying, thank God the war is over. We knew that many would be leaving graves behind them. 
And then the Allies came, and the army of occupation was the Australians. And because the interpreter that they had, who was Japanese, was not very good, they sent for me and asked if I would interpret for them. And so I would go down, and I was interpreter for the Japanese, the Dutch, and the Australians, and the Indonesians. One day I'd, and of course, we had no bath towels, we had no change of clothing. And I had just had my bath with my clothes on and was walking in the sun to try to get them dry. And I went up and sat on the edge of this shack that we were staying and sleeping in at night. And I sat down there, and all of a sudden, I looked down the road, and there came somebody in a beautiful white uniform. And I could see his shoes had been polished until the sun shone on them, and it was a beautiful sight. And I said, oh, I haven't seen such altogetherness in years. And he kept coming. And then he stopped with a group of Dutch women that were there. He must have asked where the American girl was. And so they pointed to me, and they were pointing like this, and then they all waved at me, and I waved at them, and he kept coming on. And when he got up there and stood in front of me, he just looked down. I was still sitting. And he looked down at my feet. Of course, they were bare. He said, don't you have any shoes? I thought, shoes? I said, shoes? Who worries about shoes? I said, it's good to walk in your bare feet. Makes them strong. Then he looked at me, he said, are you an American girl? I knew he'd never seen one that looked quite like I did. And I stood up just as tall as I'd ever stood before those Japanese. And I said to him, yes, sir, I am an American. And he said, and then I looked in his face and I saw that it was empathy there and not anger, not at me, but at what the Japanese had done to me in those years. And he said, I'm sorry. I should have introduced myself. He said, I am Tom Sawyer, and I'm with the American Navy, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. And it was just on the tip of my tongue to say, sure, and I'm Becky Thatcher. But I didn't know but what he might have been teased about his name before, so I put it back in. And I said, and I'm Darlene Dibler, and I'm from Boone, Iowa, in America. He said, what do you need? I said, food for our children. He said, we're going to make a free drop to you tomorrow. Is there any place? So I showed him the rice field down below us there. And I said, I know that Mr. Yamaji will give me white cloth to mark it out for you, and they will help me do it. And I said, you've got a good fly in and a good fly out on this side. And so the next day they did come, and they dropped all kinds of food to us in five-gallon friction-type lid cans. And so one of them dropped down, and the force of it caused the, all the things inside to just explode out. And after the planes had gone over, this little boy saw his mother start toward that, and he almost died of fright. He was just screaming. He said, Mother, not that one, not that one, not that. And she was going to pick up another one that still had the lid on. He said, Mother, it hasn't exploded yet. It may seem funny to some people, but it wasn't to us. Here was a little boy. All he knew was war. He didn't even recognize a tin with food in it from a bomb that exploded. I went over and picked him up, and I said, it's all right, Barocha. And I told his older brother, go and get a can, just like that one, and then open it up in front of Barocha so that he could see that there was food inside of it. And then I walked over to start picking up some of the things, and, and I saw a tin of sweetened condensed milk that had hit the ground and had burst open. And I thought, my, that is a terrible waste of sweetened condensed milk. And I grabbed it up, and I ran, let it run into my hand, and I was lapping it up. And that's the only time I ever enjoyed food going both ways, both down and up because it wasn't but minutes later that I was behind a tree, bringing it up and giving it back to Mother Nature. But um, 
our bodies were not accustomed to a lot of food, so we had to be very careful the amount of food that we ate. We knew that the Japanese did not want us to um, go out of there without shoes because this boy had made such an issue of shoes. And so one day the truck rolled in and they did it, and I'm sure they had done it on purpose, but they had taken every pair apart. They were just uh, tennis shoes, white tennis shoes, and they were all jumbled up in a mess. And they said, find yourself a pair, and they went away. And of course, they thought that we would be so troubled and so mad about it. But it was such a hilarious thing. Everybody going, trying on a shoe on the right foot. If that fit, you kept that. And then you'd go through the shoes, and you would try to find one for the left foot. And they were having a real Donnybrook, some of them, because they both wanted the same shoe. And they were fighting and pulling hair and everything. And it just got so funny. And a woman came up and stood in front of me. And she had on two right sh uh, shoes for the right foot. And they were both for the right foot. And she stood there and looked at me. And she said, do you think I should keep those? And I said, um, yes, I think I would if I were you. You can call them your laughing shoes, because everybody that saw it started to laugh, because here were two right feet going off. And she, it was just the funniest thing that ever happened and to us. And we lay there on the ground just laughing and laughing. And even those that have been fighting, I found one for my right, right foot, but I couldn't find the other one. So I just said, forget it, and threw that back into the pile. I'd walked in bare feet for all these years, so what difference did it make? But it was a funny thing. And you know, we needed that release. We were things that were funny. We'd start to laugh, and we couldn't stop laughing. We just needed to forget the terrible surroundings in which we were and what we had just gone through. So even though they did it just to be mean, by taking these all apart and throwing them in a jumbled mess there, they brought us a lot of enjoyment that day. And it was a great release for all of us. And we went away from there laughing. And uh, every shoe was gone, but a lot of them didn't have the right ones. And it was very funny. But God uh, provides those little things along the way. and they. They brought in some dresses, but those dresses that were made for us were the most beautiful, soft colors. But once they got dirty, you didn't dare to wear them again. We had no slips. And they looked like a bunch of spiders going around in a colorful web. It was, they were funny, and we would all laugh about these, because all we could do was just put our work, sh our work suit on and we'd wear these dresses over it. And of course, the work sh suit underneath was showing through. It wasn't a very pretty sight, but we were very proud of those dresses. But we knew that we couldn't go out of that camp. And even Mr. Yamaji was so concerned that I have a pair of shoes, that uh, when this boy had said, I'm going to get you a pair of shoes, and they came in, he called me over to the office to try these shoes on. Well, they were the smallest one that young man could find, but I have a rather small foot. And so when I put it on, these great big shoes on my little feet, and as skinny as I was at that time, he said, oh, they're beautiful, they're beautiful. But I knew they weren't. It looked ridiculous. I said, it's all right. I said, uh, I know somebody that they will fit. And it was a woman who, in the bombing, had had her toes blown off in Ambon, and she needed a pair of shoes. So I said, it's all right. And he said, I'll just have to get you a pair of shoes. So that's why he asked my friend to bring me a pair of shoes and a dress so that I would have that on when I went up to see my husband's grave and then when I left the place, the island. But um, he said to me that day, you know, I spoke to those men that were trying you, the Kempe Thai, and he said, I told them that nobody who believed like you did could ever be a spy. And I said, yes, Mr. Yamaji, I understand. I felt that was what you were telling them that day. And I said, Mr. Yamaji, I have spoken to the allies 
And I told him that it hadn't been for you bringing those bananas to me that day, I am sure I never would have come out of the camp alive. And he was very moved, and I said to him, when I got up to go, I said, to, you go home in peace. And he said, and you go in peace. He was sentenced to be executed because he had kicked a man to death up in the men's camp before they brought him down to ours. And we also had to stand and watch him kick a native man to death because he had come into the camp with some sugar for one of the women. And um, he uh, caught the man before he was able to give the sugar to whoever it was, for whomever it was, we don't know. But every one of us had to go out on this field and all of us stand at attention and then pass before him so that he could see if there was any expression of recognition. There wasn't. So he's a very noble native man. He never identified anybody. And when they picked up the body, I'm sure there wasn't a bone that was whole. But uh, God makes changes in people. And it was after that that I lost my husband, and they told me about it, and that the camp commander then called me over, and I'm sure he came to know the Lord that time. And then this, uh, they said, uh, we're going to take you out with the last plane load. We're not supposed to move any women or children, but if you want to go, we'll take you. And I said, uh, well, one of the ladies I don't think will come because she has had a um, mental break in the prison when we were down there. And, um, but I said, I think Miss Kemp will come with me. But I said, I want to see my husband's grave first. And so Miss Giamaggi, he told me that he would get a truck for me. And he said, and, and you go up and see your husband's grave. And uh, I did. And it was the most amazing thing, because the men that were up there, the men that were not with the military, were still in this camp. And uh, some of them that had wives in our camp had been brought down to Makassar, and the wives were taken out to be with them. But these men that were there, oh, just like cadavers, you couldn't believe the condition those men were in. But the few little clothes, they'd taken some of their clothes, and they'd gone into the villages and gotten eggs and chickens and rice and other things. And they had made the most beautiful feast I've ever seen. And they, had, they said, we knew you were coming, and we just wanted to share something with you. So as we sat around this table that was put so that everybody could see everybody else, they began to stand up. And they began to tell what my husband, Russell, had meant to them. One of them said, you know, we sometimes have these preachers that stand up in their ivory tower, and they tell us how to live and everything else. And then they go down, and they touch, never touch on the problems of our life. But here was a man that was eating the same wormy rice we were eating, that was working for the Japanese, just like we worked, was trudging through the mud when they, they took them on death march. And I think they were trying to kill them all off. And he was there in that mud and the rain. And sometimes for four days, they kept us without any food at all. So we were eating leaves off of the trees and snails and anything that we could find to, to keep our stomachs full. But that man always had a smile and a word of encouragement. He was feeling what we felt, and yet he could smile and say, God is still cognizant of our need. And others said, you know, there were times when he stood up to pray for us that I've opened my eyes and I looked and I thought Jesus must be standing right there next to him. And as they told what he had meant to them, of course, I was crying so deeply moved and yet so thankful to know that that man had been with these people that they might know. And some of them had found the Lord as their Savior. And one man came to me and he said, I want you to know that your husband was my best friend. He said, many a time I would say to him, 
I don't believe in that that you're trying to tell me. And he said he never got angry with me. I was helping him with his Dutch. And he said the night when he was sick, he said, I walked outside of his barracks. And he said, I kept saying, God, that man can't die now. I'm not ready to go. And he said, I prayed for him. And I prayed, oh, God, please don't let him die till I know you. And he said, then I heard at midnight, he was gone. And he said, so the day we took him out the next day, and we buried him. He said, I stood at the grave, and I said, if I'm ever going to see my friend, I've got to know you, Father. And he said, here I am. He said, my sin, everything is known to you. And he said, that day, Jesus came into my heart. And he said, I knew that someday I would see my friend again over there. It was the most moving thing I've ever been in. And then I stood up and I thanked them. And I said, I know that this feast was not per se for me, but you were trying to do honor to a friend who had been among you and whom God took away. And I said, so in his behalf, I want to thank every one of you here today. When I went out to get in the truck to go away, there were two big copper bags full of things those men had bought because they wanted to be sure we had food down there at the camp. And when I finally got into Makassar, here was the Japanese chaplain. And he said, I want to talk to you. He said, I want to tell you that Mr. Yamaji really came to God there when you talked to him. And he said, he's been down here many times, and I've been teaching him from the Word of God. And he said, he's a real believer. And I said to the man, you know, if it were just that one man, it was worth everything that I went through, that that man might know Jesus Christ as his Savior. We put such a small worth on the soul of a man it was worth that much for Jesus to come and die for people like him and me. And so when I got in the house, because Mr. Presswood was the only man that had survived, he said, Dr. Jaffrey died one month before peace was signed. And um, so when I opened up these bags, we had, some people have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. I had wall-to-wall -wall bananas. Because from the door over there, clear in this big room, clear to the other end of it, here were hands of bananas. And um, Mrs. Presswood said, my word, I have never seen so many, many bananas in my life. And then the boys sent word to say that the next day I would be going out, because that would be the last plane load. So I went down to the beach, and the um, plane was out there in the water, and uh, the boat came in to get me. The boys had all gotten aboard. And when I got in the boat, uh, all I could see was that wooden cross up there on the hillside that, with Dr. Jaffrey's cross over his grave, and knew how very quickly the jungle would grow in and they would be lost. And I said, God, I don't know if I will ever come back to this place again. I said, everything that's been so precious to me is gone, and I'm going home in borrowed clothes. And as I got in and they started to roll off, I row the boat out. I suddenly heard the sound of running feet, and I thought, I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to look back. I knew who it was. But I did. I turned around and looked at him. And here were these beautiful brown-skinned people, my friends, those that loved me and whom I loved so much. They were waving, and they were saying, Slamat Jal, on the peaceful journey. And then when they started to sing, God be with you till we meet again, 
There was no more bitterness, no more question in my life. I said, you stay in peace. Someday I will come home again. The boys helped us around the machine gun mounts in the back of the plane, and then the plane took off. And we went first to Balikpapan in Borneo, and put, they put us in a hospital. And um, it was a very interesting experience for us because we had never seen so much of, of cleanliness. And here were these girls there that were in the hospital, and they had pretty nighties with lace on them. And they said, what would you like to have? Would you like a cup of tea, or would you want a bath? Oh, we said, could we have a bath? Because we had been having difficulty getting enough water out of those wells and having our bath, and then just not even having anything to dry off with. And they said, well, of course, you may have a bath. And we went in there, and we had hot water in the showers. And we bathed, and we put, and there was soap there. And I said, Margaret, I said, and there's soap. And she said, yes, have you smelled it? She said, it smells so good. And we were soaping in, and then we'd rinse, and we'd soap in some more, and we'd rinse. And we washed our hair. And I don't know how long. It must have been more than an hour we were in there. And I said, I know my hair now is clean because it's squeaking. And she said, oh, and the smell of that soap. And so finally, we heard a knock on the door. And a voice said, uh, girls, uh, tea is ready. So, and you may have another shower afterwards if you liked. And so I whispered to Margaret when we came out of the stalls there, we had dried off and had put our clothes on. And I said, who would ever want a cup of tea when you can have a shower? And didn't realize that this was an Australian camp, and that's what you call the evening meal, tea. So we went in there, and we looked down, and there were, knife, there were knives and forks on the table. And they brought in Welsh rarebit. And uh, Margaret looked at me, and I looked at her, because we'd been using nothing but spoons. And we saw them take up their fork with this hand and the knife, and they cut every bite and then put it in their mouth with their fork, and then they cut the next bite. And she looked at me, and I just said, wing it. <laughs> and uh, so we pretended like we'd been doing this all those years, and we got through the Welsh rare bit. And then they went in, and they said, well, you sleep in these two beds over here. I was looking across at the girls over there, and all of them were watching us, and, and they were wondering if we weren't going to get in bed. And, and uh, so I said to Margaret, whispered to Margaret, we'll just sit on the side of our bed, and we'll read our Bibles till they turn the lights out, and then we can get into bed with our clothes on. And uh, we read, and the lights didn't go out, and we read some more, and they didn't go out. Finally, the girl was in bed up there, and she had on such a pretty nightie, and she came down, and she said, don't you girls have any night clothes? I said, oh, no. I said, but we're used to sleeping in our clothes because we always do, and then we're ready for work the next day. And the tears in her eyes, she said, not tonight. And she got the head nurse, and she said, you got to get some nightgowns for these girls. And so she went out to the PX, and that was closed. So she went clear across to the men's camp and said, need two pair of pajamas. And so they gave them to them and said for these POWs that have just come in, we were the last camp that was ever found. And uh, when they brought them back, I was so moved at their concern. And then I always laugh about things. So I took these pajamas that they had gone so far to get for us, and I put the pants on, and they were these tall, this tall unit of uh, Australians you may have heard about that are over six feet, feet tall. And I pulled the pants up here, and I said, well, I don't really need the top. And they were all laughing, and then I got the top on, was rolling it up like that, and then I'd find this hand, and I'd put that in, and, and really made a joke out of it, because I was so moved, and I didn't want to start crying. And they were crying, and then they would all clap when we got into the pajamas, and they said, now you can sleep, have a good rest. They didn't know what they were telling me, because that bed was not like that flat, rigid bamboo rack I'd been sleeping on. It had springs in it. And in the night, I'd drop off to sleep, and the spring would give it, I'd grab the side, and I thought, it's a, it's, a, it's a bombing, it's a bombing. Must be an earthquake. And then I'd feel that again, that the iron. 
And then it dawned on me. I was in the hospital. Oh, that was a terrible night. And I, Margaret finally came over very quietly and said, can you sleep? And I said, no, I can't. I said, these terrible beds. She said, let's get out and sleep on the floor. And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. I said, what if we don't wake up before they do? Oh, she said, we better go back to bed. I said, yeah, we better back, stay right back in our beds there, and even if we don't sleep. It was a long night, and it was a sleepless night, I can tell you. We got up the next morning, and the boys said, we'll put you on the last plane load again today. And so late in the afternoon, they came and got us, and they said, be ready for the last flight tomorrow morning. So we went back and we had a night there. And then we went on up to Palawan Island. I'll never forget my feeling when I flew over that great cemetery there on the island. All those white stones to mark the graves of the men that didn't make it. Boys, young men who had died that people like me might be free. And I could hardly stand it thinking of all the lives it had cost to bring freedom and peace, so-called peace, to this world. And the boys then helped us over the machine gun mounts and, and helped us down onto the, because we landed on the beach. And when I looked up and I saw that on either side of the walkway leading up to the mess hall, and that was the only building I could see, were all these young men in white and uh, I whispered to Margaret, I said, Margaret, I think they think somebody important's coming. And just then the boys put their hand behind our shoulders, said, go on now, go on. So we walked over there. And uh, when I stepped between the first two of those boys standing there, every hand came up in a salute to us. We were the last camp, the last girls to be liberated. We got up into the mess hall, and the band struck up the Star Spangled Banner. And then somebody unfurled Old Glory in the center of the hall. And I just fell apart. And I sobbed, and I sobbed. And they were all coming up and patting us and said, please don't cry. It's all over. You're free now. Finally, I was able to say to them, but you don't know how many years I thought I'll never see that flag again and I'll never hear that beautiful song, the Star Spangled Banner. And then they wanted everybody to give us something. And uh, because of our condition, I had only weighed 60 pounds when I came off death row. And because of my condition, they looked at me and they just felt they had to give us food. And they were all coming up with chocolate bars and oh, I would thank them and I hung on to them. And I was so afraid they might think that I had enough and I just, it was just like you, you were scared that they would take them away from you. And they would say, that's all right, we've got a lot more of those things. And then they brought us ice cream of all things. So I had to put them down so I could eat the ice cream. And I didn't quite finish the dish. And, and I said, but you could put that away and put it in the freezer or something. And I said, then I'll have it again afterwards. And with tears in their eyes said, don't worry, we've got a lot of ice cream. But I guess we were kind of a moving site indeed. And they had a big dinner for us. We sat at the head table, and we thanked them for all that they had done for us to bring us this far, and to know that they were the boys that had done the uh, bringing of food to the camp for the babies and for the rest of us. And as we got ready to go to bed that night, I whispered to Margaret, you know, Margaret, I think they really did know that two imper very important people were coming in. They were daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So the next day they took us on to Manila, kept us there for a month, trying to get us fed and uh, get our health back sufficiently so that they could put us on a boat to take us back to America. I asked where the post office was because I thought surely 
they would have told my parents or something about where I was and so forth. But I went over and he said, oh, I'm sorry, but there's no letter here for Darlene Dibler. And I went back the next day and he said, no, I don't have anything today either. And then about the third or fourth time, I just uh, said, and, and no mail today for Darlene Dibler. And he just leaned across the desk and he said, boy, I don't know why somebody wouldn't write to you. And then I was so embarrassed, I didn't go back again until I heard that we were being taken onto a ship. And that was a month that we had spent in Manila. And they said, uh, we're taking you now on the Grips home, uh, the, uh, the Dutch ship here that's in harbor. And so they took us, it was 23 days out of sight of land until we came to California. And we were to go in under the Golden Gate Bridge just at sunset, and that is a beautiful sight. And I was looking at that thinking, what a beautiful entrance into this land. And everybody was coming up and said, aren't you excited? And I said, well, not really. I said, I don't know anybody in California. I said, I was raised in Iowa. I don't know anybody out here. And I said, I don't have a passport. I said, everything I've had is burned, and I don't have any money. And they said, oh, well, just, just look for a Red Cross person. And then the band had begun to play. I lost my heart in San Francisco. And I thought, I haven't lost a thing here, as far as I'm concerned. And then before we could even get to a birth, they came. Uh, the word message came over the loudspeaker that we're sending you on up to Seattle, Washington, because there's not a single birth here that is vacant. And I thought, oh, that's good at least two more days in known territory. And then when I get off of this ship, what am I going to do? Well, two days later, we arrived in Seattle, Washington, and it was Navy Day. So they said, uh, well, they deloused us, and they gave us a Red Cross package, but they wouldn't process us, process us because it was Navy Day and everybody was out celebrating. I thought, that's great. I can sleep another day here night here, and we were sleeping three deep in hammocks out on the deck because we were so many POWs. Most of those were your um, people from the Philippines who had married, Filipinos who had married the boys during the war. And um, the next morning I saw all these that had become my friends getting off, and I was looking at the people down there, and even people came for Miss Kemp and I was watching them go, and then it, it hit me. The reason you've heard nothing from your daddy and mother, because as I said, we were a close family, it must be that most of the, both of them are gone. So I went out, and I crawled in under these hammocks that we had been sleeping in, out on the deck with the canvas over us. And I got on my knees, and I said, God, you took Russell. Did you have to take my mother and my daddy as well? So sweetly, he spoke to me. He said, my child, you can still trust me. I said, all right, Lord, but would you help me to find a Red Cross woman so I can get some money and get back to Iowa to trace anybody from the family that may be alive, because I knew that my brothers would be in the war. I came around the corner of the deck, and there was a Red Cross woman, and I grabbed her by the arms. I said, look, you've got to help me. I said, I'm a POW. I've heard nothing for more than five years from my dad and my mother. I don't know where they are. And I said, I just need money to get back to Iowa. Maybe I can trace somebody from the family that is still alive. She said, honey, what's your name? I said, Darlene Dibler. She said, I have three telegrams here. They're all yours, and they're all from your mother and daddy. I couldn't open them up. My hands were shaking so bad as she opened them and read. Mother said she had, we had moved down to Oakland, California in 1942. We knew you were on that ship, but when they diverted you, we could not get up to Washington in time to meet you. We have read, uh, money for you at Western Union. You go and get that, and then go and get yourself a ticket on the train, and we will be down here to meet you. And when you get to a telephone, call us, collect. So I put on the coat that was in this Red Cross box, and I'd been looking at those ladies down on the deck, 
And that year was not the shaggy dog look. Those coats had a real tight nap of the, the material that had been used. And this one they had given me, the hair was long, and I just looked like a, like a little fluffy bunny on it, I guess. And I thought, oh my, I can't go out there looking like this. They'll recognize me immediately for a POW. And so I went downstairs and I knocked at the captain's door and I said, sir, when he came to the door, may I borrow your razor? He said, my razor? I said, well, yes. Uh, would it be all right if I borrowed your razor? And he said, my razor? Well, well yeah, I'll, I'll get my razor. Just a minute, I'll get it. So he went in and he got his razor and he brought it back and he looked at me. I said, I'll bring it back. And so I went off with it and I found a sheltered place up on the deck where nobody could see me and I gave my coat a shave and it really didn't look bad. And so then I went down and gave it to him. And I know he was still puzzled why I wanted that razor, but I wasn't going to tell him. And I got to the Western Union and I picked up the money there. And then I went to the train depot. And when I got inside and went up to the uh, wire there that was uh, where this boy was standing, and, and I just said, I would like to have a ticket for Oakland, California. And I said, um, I uh, want a coach ticket. And he just looked at me and he went, my dear, don't you know a war's been on? And I looked at him, and he said, nobody travels but Army, Navy, and, and uh, Air Force personnel. Oh, I said, I didn't know that. And I started to cry. I said, I'm a POW. And I just found out my daddy and mother in Oakland, California, and I tried to get them. He said, oh, no, 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 don't cry. And he had his hand over mine. He said, don't cry. He said, I have a lot of tickets for people just like you. And he handed it to me. And then he said, now, I'll be here tonight. I'll help you get on the train. I'll show you where your seat is. And don't cry anymore. I said, thank you. And then I turned around, and I saw some telephone booths over there. So I went over there, and I opened up the door. And what you had done with telephones in eight years is amazing. When I left the States, all you did was to take up the receiver and say, Num you'd hear somebody say, number, please, and you gave them the number. And here was a metal box, and I looked at it, and some round things on the outside of it, and holes in there. And they had numbers, and they had letters. And I thought, what do you do with a thing like that? And they say, if you can't fix it, just, just uh, read the instructions. I read the instructions, and I still couldn't figure it out. And a man was evidently seeing that I was having a problem. And he just opened the door, and he said, could I be of help to you? And I said, yes, sir. I said, I've never seen a phone like this. I think he thought, what flat planet did I come off of? And I said, I don't know how to use it. My mother told me to call collect. And he said, do you have the number? And I said, yes, it's right here on the telegram. And so he called it through for me, and he said, they're answering. They're accepting the call. Here you are. And when I put the receiver up to my ear, I heard a voice down in Oakland, California, say, hello, darling. And I knew it was mother. All I could say was, hello, mother. And I couldn't answer. She talked the longest time, told me my brothers had just my brother had just come in from Germany on the East Coast, and his first question was, Mother, have you heard from Darlene? And then she told me my older, my older brother was in the Army, but because of his asthma, they didn't take him overseas. She went on to tell me how all the family was and everything. All I could say was, mm-hmm. <laughs> and she said, did you get your ticket? I said, mm-hmm. And she said, well, we'll be down here to meet you tomorrow morning when you get here. So I was there. The man helped me. You know, many people ask me, how do you know when it is the Lord speaking to you? And I think that's the most beautiful illustration I could ever think of. Because I had not heard my mother's voice for more 
than eight years. But when that receiver went up in Oakland, California, and I heard someone say, hello, darling, I knew it was mother. No one ever said my name like my mother did. And that's the way it is with my Lord. In busy airports as I travel, in the dark, the night hours, wherever I am, and when I hear a voice deep within me say, my child, I know it's my Lord, because no one else says that to me. And I know his voice. He said, my sheep know my voice. I call and they answer. They follow. That day when we pulled into Oakland, California, I was looking for two faces, my mother, my daddy, not knowing that my sister and husband and daughter had come out to be with the folks in case they had bad news. I got down from the plane, or the train, and suddenly I saw a precious, familiar face. It was my daddy. And he came and he put his arm around me and he started to call, Mother, Mother, I found her. And Mother came. And then my sister and her husband, my little niece. And we were doing nothing but just weeping together. And suddenly, the sky broke the high fog over Oakland that's often there. And the sun came through. And I said, God, if it's like this, to meet your loved ones that you haven't seen for years, what will it be like when those clouds part asunder and my Jesus will be there? So I return again and again until the whole world knows. One of these days, maybe I'll be in Australia. Maybe I won't be out there in New Guinea visiting our people. Who knows? But someday those clouds are going to part asunder, and my Jesus will be there. I am so thankful that my Lord understood and knew that that little girl at 10 years of age meant exactly what she said. And I was still go anywhere for my Lord, no matter what it costs.